Regarded as one of the greatest theologians in history, the 17th century pastor John Owen remains incredibly important for understanding Puritan and Reformed theology. And his many writings, including theological treatises, biblical commentaries, and sermons, continue to resonate with modern Christians. My guest today is Lee Gatiss, and in our conversation, he walks us through the life and times of this prolific theologian, introducing us to the man, his works, and his legacy. Lee Gatiss is the director of Church Society and a lecturer in church history at Union School of Theology. He's the chairman of the Global Anglican and on the editorial board of Studies in Puritanism and Piety. He's written or edited more than 30 books on the Bible, theology, and church history, and also serves as series editor for The Complete Works of John Owen, a new 40-volume series from Crossway aimed at introducing a new generation to John Owen's legacy. The most recent volume to be released is volume 28, which includes Owen's writings on scripture, the sacraments, and other topics related to the church. Let's get started. Well, Lee, thank you so much for joining me today on the Crossway podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So today we're going to talk about John Owen, the theologian from the 1600s. And and just as a way to introduce us to him and that topic, I want to read a quote from the late theologian J.I. Packer, who in his wonderful book, A Quest for Godliness, uh, he introduces readers to John Owen with these words. He, He writes, Owen was the greatest among Puritan theologians for solidity, profundity, massiveness, and majesty in exhibiting from Scripture God's ways with sinful mankind. There is no one to touch him. So I wonder if you, do you resonate with that sense that Packer has about Owen? Does that fit with your understanding of his importance? Most certainly, yes. Is Especially when um, Jim Packer said that Owen is massive um, because his works... <laughs> His works title somewhere in the region of eight million words. And so, so by massive, a, you mean his works, not his person. Yeah, there's a lot of him to read. And as a figure, he was a towering intellect and an extremely important person in the middle of the 17th century. One of the greatest theologians that England has ever produced and a major player during Oliver Cromwell's reign as Lord Protector of England. When we tried that brief and silly experiment of having a republic instead of a monarchy. (laughs) (laughs) So if that's true, if he really does loom that large in Mm. certainly British history, but Christian history more broadly, speak to the person listening right now who's kind of like, yeah, maybe I think I've heard his name before, but I've certainly never read anything by him. Or or maybe there's people listening who are like, I've never heard that name. I've heard of Martin Luther. I've heard Mm. of John Calvin. I've heard of St. Augustine, but I've never heard of John Owen. So what do you make of that? Maybe the relative obscurity that he suffers from compared to some of those other great figures of church history, given how significant he sounds like he was. Well, that's right. A lot of people haven't heard of him. They may think it's Jesse Owens or something like that, but it's really John Owen. I think the reason for that may be something else that Jim Packer said about John Owen, which is that sometimes his works sound like the roughly dashed off translation of a piece of thinking done in Ciceronian Latin. Uh, (laughs) And so so sometimes, sometimes he's not the easiest person to read. Some of his works are peppered liberally with Latin, Greek, Hebrew, all over the place. Uh, He was an academic theologian, uh, so a lot of his work is not the easiest to read. And uh, of all the Puritans, he isn't the most uh, down-to-earth in that sense. You'd want to read someone like John Flavel or Richard Sibbs, uh, another great Puritan, to get a a great sense of the Puritans as down-to-earth preachers. Owen's a different kind of man. He's more academic. So he is known in academic circles, but he's less well-known amongst a popular audience because some of his work is more ponderous and more difficult to understand. However, it's not all like that. I mean, some of his sermons, of course, are much more for a popular audience, usually. Some of them were addressed to university students at the University of Oxford, where he was the vice chancellor of the university. Uh, And they would be a little bit easier to get to grips with. And although he may be sometimes difficult to understand, the effort 
uh, is vastly repaid as you understand what he's saying, uh, because he's a real theologian of the heart uh, who can get to some of the heart issues that affect us in our discipleship as Christians. Uh, he understands the human heart. He understood his own heart and his own temptations, uh, his own struggles with mortification, with depression and so on. And so it vastly repays any effort you have to put in to understand him. I want to go back to something you said a minute ago. Do you say, did I hear you right, that he published 8 million words ac- across all of his works? Is that correct? Something like that, yes, about 8 million words. The um, uh, His Hebrews commentary which is one of his uh, largest works, was published in four massive volumes in the 1660s, 70s and 80s. That is two million words long. So Mm, two million words of commentary on one book of the Bible. Admittedly, it's a big book, Hebrews, but it's not that big. Um, So his commentary on Hebrews is, I think, two or three times as big as the entire Bible, (laughs) (laughs) which is quite something. And but that's only a part of his work. That would account for nine volumes of our new Crossway series of John Owen. But mm. that is a 40 volume series. So that's only about a quarter of his output. Yeah. So multiply that by four and you get about eight million words. Yeah, I wish people could see. Uh, we're talking right now over a video call and and you're holding up this incredible one of the volumes of this four volume set. And it's just it's like the ultimate version of this old beautiful big book that you can kind of imagine in your mind from hundreds of years ago so when thinking about his book the books that he's published what was his first book and then i'd love to hear what was his last book that he published before he died that's a great question we think he may have written a book on the priesthood of christ which he mentions at some point but as being his earliest book but we don't have that anymore there's Mm. no book that we can find that was published on that that material may well have made its way into some of the introductory comments that he makes on the book of Hebrews, interestingly, because priesthood of Christ is an important yeah, theme. Yeah, it fits there. Book. His first published work that uh, we have is a book against Arminianism, uh, mm. the opposite of Calvinism, uh, as we often say. It's called A Display of Arminianism. Well, it's actually got a Greek title, but it's normally known by the English subtitle a display of Arminianism. And he was a reformed theologian and wanted to write against what he saw as a downgrading of the gospel in the theological system known as Arminianism. Why did he title it with a Greek title? I think we've, we see that with other theologians from that era. The language of England at the time was certainly not Greek. So what was behind that? <laughs> No, indeed, it wasn't. That's true. One of his one of his great works, which is a big Latin work, is called Theologumina Pantodopa, which is a, a long Greek title, and then with a Latin subtitle. So we really need an English translation of that, which is on its way. I promise you, we're doing that. It's a scholarly tick, really. It's a, it's showing off. It's a flourish, a rhetorical flourish. It's mm. identifying himself as a scholarly academic theologian who knows what that means. And there's a sort of knowing glance at the audience, isn't there, at the potential readership. If you understand my Greek title, then of course you will appreciate my book. Yeah, it, it's academic signaling there. So then what what was yeah. his final book that he published before his death? Uh, well, he was working on the final volume of his Hebrews commentary, which was published po- just posthumously, just after he died. But I think the last book he was working on would probably have been his book on the glory of Christ, uh, which is a wonderful thing to be pondering and thinking about as you're on your deathbed, isn't it? To think about the glory of Christ who you are longing to see and who your soul is reaching out for as you die. And that was published just again, just posthumously after he died. But I think that's what he was working on and thinking about as he took his final breaths in this world, Mm. the glory of Christ. And he is a very Christ-centred theologian so he has a number of works on christ on christology but also a wonderful theologian of the holy spirit he wrote five volumes of material on the holy spirit a pneumatologia which is unusual not many theologians have written quite so much on the doctrine of the holy spirit so these are the great themes of his writing the trinity the holy spirit christ and the word of god
Yeah. So I want to dig into uh, a little bit more of his personal life and kind of what his day-to-day life might have been like. But before we go there, just uh, more one more comment about his kind of theological legacy. So we, you mentioned that he's known for his writings on the Trinity and the Holy Spirit, and even just the striving for holiness as God's people, as God's children. When we think about his legacy theologically, how does he kind of fit with other, again, maybe more prominent theologians like a Luther or a Calvin? We can kind of, we view them perhaps as like pivotal figures where they help to shape the trajectory of Christianity in really big, notable ways. They help to spark, say, the Protestant Reformation in the case of Luther. So does Owen have a legacy like that, or is his a little bit different or maybe less in some ways, influential compared to those other guys. Yeah, well, Owen isn't a world changer in the way that Luther and Calvin were. There are very few world changers in in human history. Someone like Marx or Aristotle could uh, lay claim to that. You know, they've changed the whole landscape of intellectual life and endeavour. Owen is not that. Owen was born in 1616, the year that Shakespeare died, which, if you think about it, is 99 years after the 95 Theses of Owen, of uh, yeah. Luther. So he wow. is 100 years after the start of the Protestant Reformation. So he isn't fighting those same battles of the, the early days. He is an academic institutionalizer, you might say, a synthesizer. He's a brilliant synthesizer of material. He's trying to defend Reformation insights into the glory of God, into justification by faith alone, uh, salvation by grace alone and scripture alone, those solas of the Reformation, you might say. He is trying to encapsulate those, defend those and pass those teachings on to several generations after the Reformation at a time when those doctrines are under increasing attack from increasingly sophisticated Roman Catholic and other opponents. And so Owen is trying to defend the fort that Calvin built, if you like. Mm, He's not building the fort himself, but he's trying to defend that same fort and developing academic, scholastic is the, the word sometimes used, but it just means academic. He's trying to develop the academic tools and defenses against those later attacks on the gospel. So that, that's who he is. That's how he fits in. That being said, there are some unique things about him and he lived at a unique time. So, that, you know, he's a very different figure to Luther mm. and to Calvin. Yeah, and we'll get into some of those things, some of the uniquenesses of his time in just a minute. But maybe before we get there, tell us a little bit about Owen the man, about Owen the husband and the father. <laughs> did he marry and have children? He did. Uh, yes, yes, he did. He'd be married a lady called Mary and they had 11. I'm sure many of your listeners will also have huge numbers of children like that. But it's, <laughs> it's uh, more common in those days than it is today. They had quite a sad life, really, because unfortunately, only 10, uh, only one of those children survived beyond infancy. So 10 of mm. them died oh, in wow. infancy. And actually, the 11th child did also to die before Owen and had a, oh. a really difficult marriage and a difficult life and then died. So he saw he had to bury all 11 of his children. His wife also died and he, he remarried uh, after she died. Uh, he married a lady called Dorothy uh, as his second wife. But yes, life wasn't easy for them as a family. Hmm. What do we know about how that impacted him? Did he write about those deaths <clears throat> of his all of his children and his wife or Or do we not have a lot of insight into that side of him? He's not terribly autobiographical, we might say. So he doesn't ever seem to base his uh, theological assertions on his own personal experience or try to gain credibility by talking about what's happened to him. You do see some of this, you get an insight into some of the, um, the personal life of Owen by reading his letters. There are some letters that survive. He, as a pastor, wrote to a woman in the congregation that he was looking after who had lost a child. She's grieving. Owen is trying to show her the comforts of the gospel. And he doesn't talk about his own experience of losing 10 children. However, Uh. he does say in that letter that if she was to throw herself on Christ and look for comfort to him, that Christ would be to her more than 10 children. And you realise if you know Owen's life at that point that that is actually 
an autobiographical comment hmm. obliquely obliquely made so unless you know him and him, who he is you wouldn't necessarily get that but he's talking about his own experience of knowing that christ is a greater comfort in times of grief than we could ever imagine mm. Mm. so yeah, we do get some of that we get some insights like that mm. yeah that's just such an incredible little transparent moment that yeah having a little bit of that context helps you to see how truly autobiographical that actually was there's some other um, times i mean i remember reading through the commentary on hebrews and you know i'm looking at the details of the greek exegesis and trying to translate the latin and hebrew as i go and then suddenly as he's speaking about the tears of christ hebrews chapter five he has a wonderful little comment just suddenly where he talks about himself and he says very you know unexpected and out of character and out of place almost in the commentary he says um i don't know how other people cope but i have often much ado to keep from longing after the shades of the grave and that's just an insight into the despondency and difficulty that he had psychologically at that time and he wouldn't have the language that we may have now i, I guess to express some of that uh, he doesn't talk about depression or anything of that sort but that is what he's that is what is going on he's, mm. I, I long for the shades of the grave uh, and the rest of another world. You know, he just drops that comment in because he understands the tears of Christ are also his tears in some way. Hmm. Sometimes I think that can be one of the hardest things about studying history and even reading the words of historical figures is it, hmm. we can feel such a separation from them. And sometimes when yeah. they aren't as forthcoming with those personal details, like we're used to being, we're used to reading books today where there is a lot of authenticity, so to speak, to the writer sharing how they feel about things. Is that uh, the it, American it, it, word for narcissism? I don't know. Nah. You, you called it <laughs> authenticity, but Maybe. for some people it does come across as very, you know, individualistic and yeah. Um, yeah, it's not Owen's style at all. He, he yeah. wouldn't talk about himself in that sort of way. But I think sometimes the challenge though for us as modern readers is it can be we can kind of forget that these men and women were real humans. They were we were yeah. just like us in so many ways. And, you know, when we read this tragedy that 10 of his or 11 of his children died before he did, we can kind of be tempted to think somehow it wasn't as bad for him as it sounds like yeah. it would be if it were us. Wow. But I think it's, it's so helpful to get those little insights in where we catch a glimpse. And, and other obviously other figures are more transparent with some of those things. And we kind of see, no, no, these were people just like us in, in every way. There are some great vignettes that you can mention about Owen. So when his academic career was cut short by the rise of Archbishop Lord, who is the great big bogeyman amongst the Puritans, he's the bad guy. We all go boo and we hear Archbishop <laughs> Lord. A Lord came in and enforced a sort of anti-Puritanism upon the University of Oxford. That cut Owen's career short. And when that happened, he... His hopes were dashed so much and he was personally so engaged in that and so involved and connected that he hardly spoke to anybody hmm. for, three, for three whole months. But in his writing, he thinks, and in his preaching, he thinks he is standing in a pulpit, he is addressing you with a word from God, so he's not there to talk about himself. He's not writing because he's got something to say about himself. He thinks he's teaching, preaching to you. And so he's mm. more going to be talking about Christ and then talking about you. Uh, mm. And he's trying to stay out the way, you know, in, in a sense, so that the message can come through him to you. Yeah, and that's where, like you said before, maybe that we should view that as a sign of his humility and, and the soberness yes. with which he took his role as a teacher and a preacher. One more question about children. So I know that he wrote some books for children in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah. So Owen was appointed after he wrote that book that I mentioned, his first book against Arminianism. The parliament thought that was terrific. And they gave him a job as a minister in a ch church in Essex called Fordham, Fordham Church in Essex. And while he was there as a Church of England parish clergyman, he decided that it'd be a good idea to, to teach the children. And to do that, he wrote some catechisms and of course we're familiar with things like the Westminster Shorter Catechism what is the chief end of man the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever you know we're used to talking about the Heidelberg Catechism or the Westminster Catechism these big corporate endeavors but lots of people at the time 
uh, lots of ministers wrote their own catechisms in order to teach the children in their parishes. And so Owen did the same and a little primer on how to read and write. And that's one thing. Uh, so he's very much uh, engaged in all the work of the parish, not just in the you know, being the celebrity preacher on a Sunday, but trying to teach the little ones as well. Hmm. So another interesting fact about Owen that I came across as I was uh, preparing to talk to you today was that uh, he actually played a role, or maybe a significant role, in the publication of John Bunyan's classic book, The Pilgrim's mm. Progress. Uh, tell right. us a little bit about what happened there. Right. Well, um, John Bunyan is in prison, of course, for illegal conventicles and praying in extempore ways rather than by using the liturgy of the Church of England, which he wasn't authorised to use anyway because he wasn't ordained. Uh, so Bunyan's in prison, uh, but he's a Puritan and he has similar convictions to Owen on some things. And Owen knows him. They're familiar with each other. And so when Owen's publishing his commentary on Hebrews, um, the first volume of that in 1668, it's published by Nathaniel Ponder, who is the um, bookseller, the, the publisher who puts that book together. And this was Ponder's first book, the commentary on Hebrews. Quite a difficult book to put together, you can imagine. But Owen then says, hey, you should publish another book. And let me introduce you to my friend John Bunyan. He's a great writer. He's definitely got a book in him. And so Nathaniel Ponder, who is Owen's publisher and published this, this deep work of exegesis on Hebrews, Ponder publishes Pilgrim's Progress and becomes known as Pilgrim Ponder because Pilgrim's Progress is a roar away, r runaway success. Uh, so is it, was success, it a success so. right away? Was it a bestseller sort of right out of the gate when it was published? Yeah, and it's never been out of print and it's in hundreds of languages and millions of editions. And that, that is one of the best-selling books of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, across uh, all the centuries so yes and that's we have owen to thank for that yeah that's incredible In a way. and then i also read that owen tried unsuccessfully ultimately but tried multiple times to actually help bunyan get out of prison because he he was in prison for so so many years why did he fail why was he not able to pull the strings necessary because uh, owen was a pretty influential well-known figure at the time and and theoretically had some political power, did he not? Well, the thing is, we look back from our century and we look back to the 17th century and it looks like one large blob of 17th century. But actually, when you're in the midst of it, it is it has uh, mountain peaks and troughs and plateaus. And the, the, um, the lay of the land at the time for Owen was different depending on which year you were in. So mm. he's a rising star in the 1640s. And uh, he's at the height of his power and influence in the 1650s under Oliver Cromwell. He's vice chancellor of the university, dean of a cathedral church and college in Oxford, a well-known celebrity writer and leader. And then in 1662, he's ejected from the church with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and the new regime. He is ejected. He's in the wastelands. He's in the desert. No influence, really. And he's in exile in that sense within his own country. And although he is um, still alive, he isn't bumped off by the new regime in revenge or anything. He does have some access to the king as a leading nonconformist. And he does go and see the king uh, on, a, on a couple of occasions. To, to speak to him. At one point he says to, you know, the king said to him, why do you knock around with this guy Bunyan? Isn't he just like a tinker or something? What, <laughs> what do you want to do with him? He's not a great academic like you are. And Owen just said to him, well, your majesty, I would gladly give up all my learning to be able to preach like John Bunyan. Oh, um, wow. And Owen did go before the king on occasions to, to say, you know, please can you not persecute the nonconformists quite so much? And it didn't always work because Owen wasn't in power anymore. So although he had some access occasionally when it was allowed, he didn't have the power that he may have wielded some years before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also read related to that, that Owen was perhaps surprisingly an advocate for religious toleration in mm -hmm. a way that might be might resonate with us today in, in some ways, but might have been a little bit out of step in some ways with his, his own day. Like, tell us more about his efforts to promote that kind of toleration. Yeah, and that's a quite an interesting and unique sort of thing about Owen, is that even when he is in power, so to speak, the chaplain, 
to Oliver Cromwell, the preacher for the Council of State, and he's appearing in Parliament to, to preach and so on. Even then, he is advocating for a form of toleration of others. So he is not trying to make everybody in the country into a congregationalist, which is what he eventually decides he is. He begins as an ordained Anglican minister, ordained by a bishop, and he flirts with the idea of Presbyterianism, which many people do before they grow out of it. There's a twinkle in my eye as I say that. But he <laughs> flirts with Presbyterianism. Some of my best friends are Presbyterians. But then he eventually decides, under the influence of an American writer, John Cotton, uh, who's English but living in America, that he will be a Congregationalist. But Owen doesn't think that everybody has to be a Congregationalist and that we should have a system whereby you can be tolerated under the umbrella of a Protestant Reformed settlement. And mm. as long as you can sign up to certain basic things that you, you should be allowed to be having your own churches and ministers and so on. And mm. so that's interesting. He's, he's wanting toleration even when he's in charge. Yeah. And he fights for that same sort of toleration when he's not in charge, when he's on the outside. He's still trying to advocate for that sort of toleration. I think that has an influence on people like John Locke, who is a, a very influential over the American Revolution or the illegal colonial rebellion of 1776. <laughs> uh, Depending some on years your perspective. Later. Yeah. Precisely. Yes, exactly. You'll be back, as George III says in, uh, in the, the musical in Hamilton, Hamilton, which is a scurrilous piece of American propaganda. But there we are. Uh, yeah. So I think Owen's ideas of toleration under an umbrella of reformed Protestantism are very influential in the future. Of course, he's not tolerant of everything. He's, he doesn't want toleration for Roman Catholics because they are also a present military and political threat to mm. the country and of course many protestants and reformed theologians at that time would have called roman catholicism evil uh, the pope is the antichrist they would have said so there was no toleration for that um, and equally he didn't want toleration for anti-trinitarianism that was a an evil scourge that had to be eradicated and not allowed uh, mm. to, to function in the, in the state and the state ought to enforce that the state ought to be telling people not to preach against justification by faith and alone and not to be preaching against the trinity and that's something the magistrate the state ought to be enforcing so mm. it's interesting because he doesn't believe in that modern american heresy of the separation of church and state either uh, yeah so he, right. you know the past is a different country they do things differently there right mm. Yeah, absolutely. So then taking a kind of a big step back, as you think about Owen's, his life, his ministry as an academic, as a pastor, his preaching and theology, we've talked a lot about some of his strengths and his insights into things that we can learn from him even today. What would you say are some of his biggest blind spots, in your opinion, as you think back about his legacy? His biggest blind spots. Well, wow. obviously he should have remained an Anglican, which is what I am. So um, <laughs> that's obviously his biggest blind spot. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty uh, big one. He, sh he should have seen the superiority of the Anglican way or something. Uh, no, I don't really believe that. That's a really interesting question. He would have had trouble seeing the later ideas of toleration, for example, that we now hold to and the idea of the separation of church and state, which many hold to in the States and elsewhere. Um, he just wouldn't have seen that as a good idea. He couldn't see mm. how that would function and have a stable society. <laughs> Maybe he was right. Do we have stable societies now? I don't know. Mm. There were limits to his imagination in that sense. It's such a good question. I'm not sure I can come up with a better answer than that right now. And it'll be something I'm <laughs> pondering late at night. I won't be able to sleep tonight after that one, Matt. Thank you for, for asking. No, me. that's all right. That's spots. good. So then if you were to summarize, speaking to a, a listener today, a pastor today, or Again, a layperson who, who does have a love for theology, a love for church history. If you had to summarize, why would you say Owen is worth investing maybe some effort in to read today? Because of the depth of his insight into the human heart and the human condition in his, some of his applied theology, particularly his works on mortification of sin, uh, his works on indwelling sin, and um, his sermons applied to the human heart. There's some great insights there into how we function 
and how we ought to function. And also because of the profundity of his theological thinking. As I say, he's not usually a unique and um, world-changing theologian. Uh, he's synthesizing the best of the Protestant Reformed tradition and defending that against increasingly sophisticated enemies. But he does sometimes come out with something that is just so good that you were dwelling on it for a long time. Some really pithy comments, for instance, in one of his books on sin, he says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And that's mm. so good. I've got it on a mug. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can drink your morning <laughs> coffee and remember that. But at other times he's dwelling deeply on the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, because there are anti-Trinitarians around, he's thought a lot about how to defend the truth of the Trinitarian gospel against those people. And so when he's preaching on the Trinity, he does in, in one of his books called Communion with God, Communion with the Triune God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He comes up with something that is very rare, which is a unique idea in the history of theology, which isn't dodgy, because often if you hear something novel, in, uh, in theological circles, it's usually heretical. But this idea, Owen says we have distinct communion with the Father, distinct communion with the Son, and distinct communion with the Spirit, because they are three persons in one God. And so we have distinct communion relationship with each one. And he develops that from Scripture as to what our distinct relationship with each person is. And no one had really done that. No one had uh, developed that thought and he does it while constrained by Nicene orthodoxy um, so he's very careful in the way that he formulates those things within the western catholic tradition of Augustine and so on but it is a, a new idea that is well worth dwelling on also his exegesis of the book of Hebrews I mean it is long and if you're going to preach on Hebrews and use Owen as your commentary help then maybe you want to choose small sections of the of the book and preach a verse or two at a time rather than whole <laughs> chapters because you give yourself a lot to read that way but his his commentary is at the cutting edge of the application of hebraic judaism judaism uh, works to the study of the new testament in his day no one was really reading all of the hebraic sources um, and the works of the rabbis, medieval rabbis and, and early first century Talmud, Mishnah and so on, and applying those to the study of the New Testament in the way that he was. Few people did that. Uh, John mm. Lightfoot here in Cambridge was doing that with the Gospels. Owen does it with Hebrews in a way that is groundbreaking and almost unrepeated since. So he was a true academic in his time. Yes, deep thinking, yeah. academic. He would have talked a lot in Latin because that was the language of the le lecture hall at the time. So he'd be wandering around those hallowed hallways in Oxford, crossing the quads and uh, speaking to, to his fellow students and academics in Latin, lecturing in Latin, writing in Latin. However, Owen sometimes in his English sounds like he is speaking Latin <laughs> and just translating it simultaneously in his head into some form of English. But it is surprising, isn't it, that of all the works he wrote, only one or two volumes are in Latin. Most of it is English because he does have that idea that it should be in a language that's understood by the people mm. and we shouldn't dress everything up in academic Latin. That being mm. said, he could write at that level if he wanted to and for the academic community. So... Maybe a final question. I wonder if you could bring Owen into our modern day for a moment and and give us a sense for maybe how he would have responded or thought about certain issues that are important to us today. And so th the main one I think of is just the denominational divisions that we see around us. It seems like it, it's almost a truism to say that the evangelical church, both in the U.S. and, and abroad, we particularly in Europe, maybe more than other places, there is this fracturing happening where we can see more and more divisions, less of them theological in nature perhaps, but political at times or uh, related to uh, social issues and concerns. If Owen were alive today, what do you think he would make of or what would he think of the denominational uh, and the ecclesiastical divisions in the church today? He would lament those, as we do, I hope, because unity in the gospel, in the truth, is so important in the Bible, because it's important to God. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of unity. He was trying to build the church as a dwelling place for God in unity, in Christ, and that everything is under Christ. And we, we ought to 
maintain that unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So he would lament the fracturing of the church and the doctrinal downgrading of the church, the lack of concern for doctrine in many parts of the church would be a huge concern to him because it isn't just about our inner feelings, the inner light that we might have. I feel God is like this. I feel God is like that. There is a truth, a deposit of divine revelation that we have. And so he would lament the um, neglect of that in large swathes of the church. And he would want to work for an evangelical unity in truth. So I think that's how he would respond to that. I think he'd be shocked by where we are as societies in the way that revisionist social ethics and, and cultural norms have changed so dramatically uh, with the decline of Christianity throughout the West. That would be deeply, deeply shocking to him. Uh, although the Puritans were trying to reform the society that they were in, it was an ongoing thing and he'd be appalled at the way we failed to engage and failed mm. to, to try to change our societies and our churches in that, in that regard. So yeah, obviously he would be orthodox, Protestant, reformed, traditional, biblical in terms of the modern ethical issues. So if we think about abortion or same-sex marriage, things like that, he would very much stand with those who are conservative or traditional, biblical, whatever words you want to use to describe that, and no doubt would write hefty tomes against why the other side were wrong on, mm. on those issues. Mm. He uh, would be amused, about... I'm sure, to know that he was on the same side as the Roman Catholic Church on, on some of those ethical issues of the day. But what about the broader kind of political landscape that we're in, in our country in particular, but again, also in Great Britain and elsewhere in Europe, where we, we also see just political polarization increasing. And sometimes we can kind of say, ah, oh, we live in the most polarized times in the history of the world, you know, or in the history <laughs> of our country. No. And yeah, how, how would he respond to something like that? What perspective could he bring well, to that? He would say, are you in the middle of a civil war? <laughs> because you're not. And he was. I mean, he literally was living in a time of civil war. And he went to war with Oliver Cromwell, the great general, he saw the battlefield. He was there with Cromwell when he fought the Scots and the Irish trying to bring the Celtic fringe to heel. You know, he was there and he, he knew people in the army. His brother was in the army. He was used to a time of turmoil and polarisation and instability. In the 1660s, when he's on the outside and not in power, uh, he was watched by the authorities they came to his church to listen to his sermons. At one point, he was caught in the street by informers and only just managed to escape. The authorities, the FBI of the day, uh, raided his house at one point, And they didn't find lots of secret documents that he shouldn't have had and, and classified things he should have given back. No, they, they found that he had six boxes of pistols. Six <laughs> boxes of pistols. Oh, wow. Because... Clearly, he, he felt that this is such an unstable time, I need to keep hold of a bit of a personal private arsenal. Now, I know that if you live in Texas, six boxes of pistols is poultry and not really yeah. very much. Yeah. Um, They're all but for most right people, <laughs> for most people, that's quite a lot. Uh, and it just shows as a little vignette there that he's living in very unstable times. Huh. He could well have lost his head or been burned at the stake or something in his day. Huh. And we don't tend to do that nowadays except on twitter do, do we know what he was planning to do with all those guns like was there any <laughs> indication was he like gonna was he part of some uprising or was it all just personal security or something there have been suggestions that he was involved in certain plots throughout that period after the restoration of the monarchy i think I and mean, he's very close to some people in the army some some former commanders in the Republic Army, and so he may have just been, you know, looking after the guns for a friend, as they say. <laughs> Super uh, so suspicious. That, yeah, I mean, we look back and we can see that the restoration of the monarchy did take. I mean, it it held, but he didn't know that. Mm, you don't yeah. know, in the middle of the 1660s, whether military defeat at the hands of the Dutch, the comets that are in the sky, the Great Fire, the plague, all these may have been portents of great upheaval and the shaking of the nations that he thought was still happening, and we may get another civil war. So he didn't know that. So it's personal insurance 
in that sense. But also, you know, his close ties to parts of the military, um, the Cromwellian military, probably mm. account for the fact that he had a little stash, a cache mm. of weapons, yeah. just in case. Well, th thank you so much, Lee, for uh, introducing us to Owen, a fascinating figure, maybe more fascinating, more intriguing than we even would have expected coming into this. Uh, but appreciate you taking the time to do that and uh, are so excited about this 40 volume set of Owen's complete works that you and many others are helping to produce with Crossway. Nice to chat to you today, Matt. Thank you. That was Lee Gatiss on John Owen's life and legacy. For more, be sure to check out The Complete Works of John Owen, a new 40-volume series from Crossway aimed at introducing a new generation of Christians to John Owen's work. Pick up a print copy of any of the currently available volumes for 30% off or get the eBooks for 50% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org. If you enjoyed this interview, check out my conversation with Dane Ortland entitled The Unlikely Legacy of Jonathan Edwards. Follow the link in the show notes to hear Dane discuss the life and legacy of an 18th century preacher most famous for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. For more audio content like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a review. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's Word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.